another great magazine that uh, I really enjoy. It's his first year that he came out with the magazine. It's uh, and it, I don't want to say magazine because it's kind of like a, a harder copy. It's not a hard copy, but it's it's a harder copy than a magazine cover. But so much information. I, you could tell this guy's an engineer. I mean, because the brain at work of Warren Sharp, SharpFootballAnalysis.com, is absolutely incredible. Never stops. Just continues all the time. And he does it with the breakdowns, offense, defense, players. Now he's going to help us out a little bit on needs for uh, some of these teams in the upcoming draft. He's not going to just break down players and get into it like Mark Lawrence did, but tell us what teams need in order to try and righten the ship. But first off, i got to just thank him for coming by because it's his off season and he's working on everything else and uh, working on the, on, the, on the publication again and another successful season. And, you know, when you're endorsed by Bill Crackman Krakenberger, you're doing something right because that guy endorses, like, three people in the world, and you're one of them, Sharpie. <laughs> well, thanks for that intro. His, his mom's the other one, too. Uh, we got to say, say some prayers for his mom. Uh, she's she's uh, dealing with some health issues right now. But, yeah, um, obviously love talking with you guys out there and uh, certainly excited to get this magazine uh, to the marketplace. I'm looking to come out with it a couple uh, weeks earlier than it did last year. It's going to come out probably the third week in June. I'm well on my way. I've been working since late February, so it's been about two months in the books. And I'm uh, I'm in love with the layout, and, and this version is going to be much better than what even last year's was. I've got a lot of a lot of new things in there this year, and I think it's going to make it a lot easier for the reader and also more um, information for the reader, too. So I'm really looking forward to it. Good to talk to you, Warren. And that, that's what I was going to ask you. You had one year under your belt, uh, you know, putting your publication out for the first time. This time around, is it easy for you as well? You mentioned it's going to be a little easier on the reader and you've got some new twists. Is now that you've had that first run, you know, in, in getting the magazine out there, is the second time around a little bit easier and you've got a little better insight going forward with it this time? Well, yeah, to an extent, definitely. Um, I I certainly, you know, can mention the engineer element. I'm a very critical thinker and very self-critical. And so I loved the publication when I came out with it last year, you know, got a lot of great reviews and was one of the best sellers on Amazon when it was released. But, you know, I, I sat here in February and looked through it again in detail, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I could have done so much more with this. I could have made things so much better, reorganized these different things and added other sections. And, and so I really decided to attack it hard this year. So from the perspective of I knew what I did last year and I know how I can make it better this year, absolutely. Um, it's easier from that perspective. Um, from the perspective of I know how much work it's going to take to to finish it off and make it be as good as I want it to be, uh, it, it's still going to be a challenge. Um, I don't have, you know, a team of 10 different people working for me on this. I'm the guy who does Everything from start to finish, including layout, including editing, including writing, including all the metrics. So um, there's been a lot of new metrics that I've created, a lot of new visualizations that I've added. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to uh, to getting it out there. Well, Warren, now that you're in this uh, for the long haul, I'm sure it'll be better every year and continue to get more and more fun for you. Yeah, I hope so, too. Yeah, no doubt about it. I thought it was outstanding. And again, uh yeah, I mean, that's the thing when you do the first one and you sit back after it's put together. And, and then, of course, you know, with the type of clientele that you have at SharpFootballAnalysis.com, you're going to get some good constructive advice from people saying, hey, what about this? Or can you do this a little different? And so you take all that and it's just going to help you, as Mark Lawrence will tell you, back when he started the playbook, as opposed to now, you know, things changed over the years and now he's got it tweaked exactly where he wants it. And that's exactly where you're going to have your... Uh, your publication, but the main thing is, Warren, the information is there. And when you continue to win and you're successful and the uh, the model is there, and, and again, you're somebody that you don't force plays. There's many times that I've had you come on SportsX Radio and prior to, you're like, KT, I, I don't have anything yet. I'll, I'll go over games and I'll, I'll talk about criteria and this and that, but there's just nothing really that is, is jumping out at me or, or something that I'm going to put my hard-earned money on, so I'm not going to ask anybody else to put it on. 
Yeah, it, it obviously is a challenge every time that you're, you know, doing media because you want to be as informative as possible. And that's one of the, the things that I enjoy doing. I love just sharing information with people. I love helping people understand the game of football a little bit better, a little bit more efficiently, because I really feel they get led astray a lot of times when they just flip on the TV on Sunday and listen to the announcers, you know, during the games. And so I like to present a little bit different perspective on why teams should try things a little bit differently, efficiency, play calling. You know, I I really dig down into the analytical side of football. So uh, I don't talk quite as much as you know about, you know, ATS this or trends that, but I spend a lot of time with, with the X's and O's in the game of football itself trying to teach people about it and so if that there's some weeks where the plays are light the games are the recommendations i have are light you know i i generally will not recommend people do anything at least from me at least from me because um you know i think as you guys know the line makers are not always wrong but every single week there are certain games that are wrong So they're not widespread wrong across the board and everybody should be looking to make a lot of action. No, it's it's certain targeted areas, as you guys well know, and as you guys do yourselves. Warren Sharp with us, sharpfootballanalysis.com. Warren, you know, we everybody focused in and and, uh, the draft starting tomorrow, but there were a lot of off-the-field transactions uh, that are going to uh, be major coming up this season in New England. Very busy in the off-season. Tell everybody about some of the uh, goings-on there with the Patriots. And, and again, they're bringing in some people like Cooks, or like Allen. I mean, they're making some key moves right now. Yeah, they are. And I think one of the things that, um, that New England did awesome last year that a lot of people don't realize the impact that this has is – passes to the running back. Um, As we know, White in the Super Bowl, uh, he led the team in receptions. I mean, he he was the second leading receiver on the team that season, uh, but he's just a running back, so a lot of people overlook that. But um, he was a dangerous weapon out of the backfield. What they ended up adding, they they stole uh, Gillisley out of Buffalo like they did with Hogan the year before that. Gillisley um, and Rex Burkhead, the number one and the number two running backs in run success rate, which means the amount of times that they grade out as successful on a particular run, and that simply means based upon down and distance, did you gain the required yardage, and it changes uh, based upon how many yards to go and what down it is for that play to be graded out as successful. And those two guys, if they were, um, if you limit it to at least 70 carries, those were the number one and number two running backs in terms of success rate last year, and most people don't even know their names because they were backups. They didn't really get a lot of work, um, but New England has both of those guys now, and they still have the, the um, ability to pass to them out of the backfield, of course. They still have White there. Um, they they are, got Deion Lewis under another year of contract. And then, of course, they had Brandon Cooks, like you mentioned. So they're just a multifaceted team. They understand two very important things to efficiency, actually three. Uh, it's very difficult for the defenses to guard tight ends on the early downs as well as running backs out of the backfield. They've got Gronk, they've got the running backs, and also the way to just really flip a game quickly is the explosive plays, and they've got Hogan who can do that, and Cooks can to an extent as well. So this offense just, I mean, it's better than what it was last year, and they won the Super Bowl last year. Um, so it's, it's just a very difficult team to defend. It's a very, uh, they're going to be very good offensively this upcoming season. Yeah, Warren, I, I don't see them slowing down uh, much at all this year. Uh, interesting that you mentioned that the the pass out of the backfield to the running back i've always loved that play i grew up watching the 49ers they were very successful with it with ricky waters and roger craig and i think there's a couple of running backs in this draft uh that are also very good at at doing that uh christian mccaffrey and dalvin cook Uh, are there a couple teams that you see that could really utilize one or uh either of these gentlemen yeah absolutely um i mean i think Hitting the running backs out of the backfield, there's two things that's involved. Obviously, number one, you have to have an offense that's willing to do that. And, you know, a lot of people are mocking Christian McCaffrey to Carolina. And while I think that that would be great for them because their ability to hit the running backs out of the backfield, they don't target them very much. um, So that could help. And they're not very successful when they do target them. Uh, But the key is Cam Newton, the way that he plays, generally speaking, what happens with a lot of quarterbacks, especially pocket quarterbacks like Brady, like Roethlisberger, these types of guys, 
they want to hang out in the pocket. And if they don't see the routes develop well enough down the field, they'll hit the running backs out in the flat. Well, Cam Newton generally just tends to scramble in those situations. So um, some of McC- unless Cam changes and tries to avoid the hits and decides to dump it off to McCaffrey, McCaffrey more often, um, they might not utilize him well enough. But I just saw a mock come out tonight from a guy that I respect, Bob McGinn, of, uh, from the Green Bay area, and he's mocked Christian McCaffrey to Cleveland at number 12. 12, um, with the Carolina Panthers taking Fournette at number eight. And obviously, I mean, Cleveland at number 12, they sure could use him, but uh, I think, you know, a lot of his talent is going to go by the wayside there. So I would love to see a guy like Christian McCaffrey land on a decent team. I mean, even if it's Philadelphia, I think he's going to be able to help that offense immensely. And any coach who thinks that McCaffrey is, quote unquote, a running back, um, you know, needs to check in their pass at the door because he's such a more dynamic option. They need to be lining him outside, lining him up outside. They need to be targeting him on first down. They need to keep him on the field for short yardage situations. There's just so much you can do creative, creatively with a guy like Christian McCaffrey. What is your take as far as Cleveland? Where do you see them going? Are you convinced that they do grab Miles Garrett number one overall? And if so, if uh, other people are projecting you know, Christian McCaffrey to go to Cleveland at number 12. Do they pass on a quarterback altogether with those first two picks? Well, interestingly enough, as you say that, uh, you know, there's been some like 11th hour type discussions and Mitch Trubisky is actually rumored to be going number one now. I heard that. Cleveland. Yep. And, and, and basically the owner of the Browns, Jimmy Haslam, um, stepped in and, you know, kind of did the same type of thing. Remember when the Browns, when they, when they were looking at quarterbacks and they were told by, they paid for a report, it said Teddy Bridgewater is the best guy, but, you know, Jimmy Haslam talked to some homeless guy who recommended that he go after Johnny Manziel, so that's why he ended up drafting Johnny Manziel. He told the team, hey, I don't care what this report says, let's get Manziel. Well, the rumor is that he has come in the door and said, I love Miles Garrett, but we need a quarterback and let's go ahead and take Trubisky. So, who knows? knows it's it's going to be really exciting watching this thing play out but uh, i think it's really up in the air right now wow and i think uh odds wise you could have you know far away places or, or even here I, I think they're uh brady you could, could have got trubisky at a pretty good price well first year in history that nevada now has uh legalized uh being able to bet on the draft and i and i don't think you can actually bet on where a player goes or what team he goes to, but you, but more of a proposition nature. How many running backs are going to be taken? What position is going to be taken first? More more of that. I, I don't know all the ins and outs, but it is indeed the first year uh, that you've been able ever been able to bet on the draft in Nevada. And Warren, I did see uh, you know because Golden Nugget. Uh, Tony Miller and Aaron Kessler, those guys put out some stuff where, you know, you could bet on conferences and uh, and even teams, how many uh, pr- prospective uh, players out of Alabama will go in the first round and SEC and LSU guys and stuff like that. Uh, do you get involved in anything like that prop wise or you strictly or, or do you strictly do you uh, stay with, you know, sides and totals as far as games? Yeah, I, I steer clear of that. And here's the reason why. I'm not going to waste enough of my time worrying about all the rumors and innuendo and everything that would be required to do that well. Um, Because what it comes down to is most teams see – what are the needs? They establish what this team's needs are ahead of the to- ahead of the draft, and then they draft for need or you know talent. If somebody falls to them, they're just going to take the best player on the board. Sometimes, well, you know. You have a couple weird things happen at first and second pick, and everything gets screwed up to an extent. Um, so I let the guys who sp- spend year-round figuring out the draft, I let them do that. I worry about figuring out right now what are the team needs, and then I wait to see the draft happen, and then I immediately begin to analyze, did they address those needs? And it's very difficult to grade a draft class You know, that first season. We don't really know how these guys are going to pan out, so it's interesting that there are people who will immediately grade the draft. I think trying to figure out and understand it and maybe put a grade on it, okay, but don't beat your chest about this is what the grade that this, you know, this pundit is giving this team. We really don't know yet how well that's going to play out, but we certainly can probably tell where some teams really missed badly, and uh, those are worth noting. All right, prognosticate for me uh, the team in your backyard because, again, a lot of rumors circling around the Redskins on things that may happen in the near future. But what about Washington as far as the draft? What do they need? 
They need a lot of everything. They need a lot of help on defense. I mean, they obviously lost a couple of wide receivers. It's going to hurt not having Deshaun Jackson there to stretch the field. Pierre Garçon was one of their most efficient efficient weapons um, at receiver. But they still have a very good offensive line that has coached up very well with off, uh, offensive line coach Callahan. Kirk Cousins, you know, they're paying him a lot of money on the franchise tag, but he's still there. they still got Jordan Reed and Crowder and some other weapons they're hoping to develop from the receiver position. Their defense needs a lot of help. Uh, there's a good chance, you know, I've, I've heard guy uh, McKinley out of UCLA is being mocked to them as, as a linebacker, outside linebacker. Uh, they were just terrible and against the run, the worst team in the NFL from an efficiency standpoint against the run. Uh, they couldn't get a significant and sustained pass rush going. So there's a lot of problems with the Redskins' backfield, uh, sorry, uh, defense. And I think that they're going to need to address that early in this draft. Um, and then, you know, the craziness that ensued with the general manager basically get, being run out of town and, and all of that that comes along with it. And now George Allen trying to t- seize control and figure out things. It's, it's just a mess over here. You, you, happy to, you guys should be happy you're not anywhere close. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's a big loss on draft day, too. McLaughlin uh, was a heck of a, a scout, and, and it's unfortunate what happened to him. Uh, Warren, I agree with you. You know, the defense was awful for Washington, but one position you didn't mention, and I think where they're really lacking as well, is running back. Yeah, they 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 have not had a decent running back for a while. Chris Thompson out of the backfield is kind of like this quote-unquote third down back. Uh, was effective for them, but they don't didn't have the you know first and second down pounder with consistency. They had a couple guys that they would be rotating in. I will tell you though, th- this whole notion of the quote unquote third down back I think is prehistoric to an extent. Um, there's these guys if they're good at catching passes out of the backfield, I really believe that these teams need to be throwing the ball to them more often on first down, not waiting for third down. Actually, if you look at the metrics and analytics, the least efficient time to target a running back out of any down and distance, I don't care what the distance is, the least efficient time to target them is on third down. On third down, hit a tight end or a wide receiver. That's going to be your more efficient play to get a first down. On first down, actually targeting a running back out of the backfield in the passing game is more successful in terms of success rate than throwing the ball to a wide receiver. And the, the moment that more teams figure out that we need to get these great third down backs who are such a matchup nightmare on linebackers and get those guys out there on first down and target them out of the backfield, uh, you know, those teams are going to instantly become more efficient and lead to fewer third down opportunities that they have to try because they're going to be gaining first downs on first or second down. Warren, are there a couple players uh, and a couple of teams maybe in this draft that you see lining up the way the chips may fall here that really have you excited? Like, I think, you know, this team's going to get that guy and that should really uh, do wonders for them. Are are there any situations that you see possibly developing that uh, have you intrigued in this draft? You know, I I really have, that's the thing, I don't have a lot of confidence in anything. I think some years maybe you go with the guys who are most successful because they grade out all these draft pundits and they grade out which ones have been the most accurate. You know, some of these guys get good information, some of them don't, some of them guess too much, and some of them are more accurate. And at any rate, you can look at what they've done historically. But I think a lot of people this year are are just like, well, we're not really sure, you know, because there's just so many different things that can happen. There's uh, there's no real you know, I don't think, at least in this draft, a franchise caliber quarterback. Trubisky has just only had 13 starts, and, and so he's really kind of a budding guy, but nobody really knows exactly how successful he could potentially be. Um, so, no, I don't, I'm not really excited or really think that any particular team is uh, that I know. I mean, they obviously know, but I don't know from sitting here which, guy, which teams are locked into certain uh, players that are very likely to take them. Um, and as a result, you know, I just I know what some of these teams' needs are. I know what they need to do in the draft, and we'll see, you know, how it plays out once this draft is concluded in in terms of what my immediate reaction is for the upcoming season and which teams address some of those needs and which teams really did not and and really still have gaping holes because there's a number of teams this year that have gaping holes in their roster in terms of the the quality of their talent. Warren, talk to me about the Raiders because, uh, again, so much anticipated here in Las Vegas and the – 
the picks on Saturday. They have a fifth round pick and two picks in the seventh round, and they're going to be made over by the Welcome to Las Vegas sign, I believe, if I read everything correctly. Uh, but they, they've got needs on the defensive side of the ball more so than the offense. Is that what you see the Raiders are, are going to look uh, as far as through the draft and, uh, you know, getting Marshawn Lynch uh, today? You know, again, don't know what he has left in the tank, but, you know, comment on that as well. Is that a reach for the Raiders? Uh, Two-year deal, you would figure it, uh, you know, from his camp, that's probably – uh, the least amount of uh, time that he would want to make sure that he at least had a, a couple years as far as under his belt. And he's an Oakland guy, and you know he's going to give 110%. He knows how to run on game day, but I just don't know what you think he's got left in the tank. And, and talk to me about what you think the Raiders need to shore up that defense. Yeah, you know, the, the run game is going to be extremely interesting because a lot of people probably don't talk about this, they don't think about this, but if you go to my stats website, sharpfootballstats.com, I've got up there a page where you can look at strength of schedule. I've already projected it across the entire uh, NFL for this upcoming season, and you can actually compare that to what they actually faced last season. So from a run game perspective, the Raiders last season faced the fifth easiest schedule of opposing run defenses, the fifth easiest. This year they're going to face the ninth hardest schedule of opposing run defenses. Now it's not consistently difficult, but they play a number of teams that are inside of the top ten in terms of run defense, including the Ravens and the Titans and the Giants and the uh, Patriots and the Jets and a couple others. So they face a number of very decent run defenses this year. Um, There are a couple of games, soft pockets, week seven through nine, when they play the Chiefs and the Bills and the Dolphins in consecutive weeks. Uh, Those are some worse run defenses, but um, um, all things considered, a much more difficult schedule for Marshawn Lynch this year. And then you look at the, the rust and the time off and some of the, the potential injuries. I mean, it's, I, I love the guy. I love his style. I love his aggressive nature. I love the he's just going to leave it all out there on the field. Um, but it's going to be a challenge for him in, in certain weeks and, you know, to see if he can last the entire season. You're right. That offense, though, extremely productive, extremely um, effective, especially against the very difficult schedule last year. They actually played the number one overall schedule of pass defenses last season, yet they ranked seventh in passing, uh, fourth in passing efficiency um, last year. It is their defensive side that they need some work on. Uh, they were struggling a little bit to get to the quarterback, which was surprising, you know, with the year that Mack had a couple of years ago. They ranked 30th in pass rush efficiency efficiency this past season so they need to do a lot better job of getting to the quarterback and I could see them uh, taking a couple of early picks you know within the first three rounds on that defensive side of the ball all right my good buddy uh, Tony Miller big Dallas Cowboys fan what about the Cowboys because now with Romo going to the booth do they look uh you know, maybe to, to grab a backup. I know Kellen Moore is there coming off the injury, but I'm just wondering, you know, if Romo maybe has that wink, wink, nod, nod deal with, uh, you know, Jones as far as, look, I'll be ready just in case Dak Prescott, something goes wrong. I'll be ready to roll. I know the system. Your take, did he not want, did Romo not want to go anywhere else like a Denver or Houston? Uh, you know, because to me, he still had, you know, the, I don't know. I, I, I still think he had the drive to try and get a ring or, or to get back at least to the postseason. Yeah, I think that he he realized the difficulty that he was up against. Um, and, and it's tough. It's tough to stay healthy. It's tough to perform well and perform adequately. Um, and, you know, being the backup there, you know, it was difficult. And I thought he saw some better options. And he probably more, more than anything just didn't want to get re-injured. Um, so that was a big thing as well. Um, look, they faced a very difficult schedule last season of opposing um, defenses. They're going to face a very difficult schedule this upcoming season as a result of the, you know, the, the schedule that they got because they had a good year last year. But much like some of these other teams, just like we talk about the Oakland Raiders, uh, I think they need to improve their, their pass rush. And they've had a couple losses in their secondary. So I, I see them behind a great offensive line. They obviously have a great run game. They've got a lot of hope and, and optimism for Dak Prescott. Scott, and for good reason, let him grow into that offense. They've got a decent passing game as it is. Obviously, uh, Jason Witten left, but they've got pieces there on offense. I think they need to go defense. And here's one thing that we talked about Oakland. I'm talking about it with regard to Dallas. Passing efficiency is four times more correlated to wins than rushing efficiency. People have now started to catch on to that. It's about 
having success against that opposing quarterback as well as your own quarterback having success. And the number one way to have success against an opposing quarterback is to disrupt him, disturb him, whether you're sacking, hitting, uh, hurrying him in the pocket. You want to make him uncomfortable. It's going to really affect that team's ability to have success on the field. And I think, you know, for Dallas, either get somebody who can cover or get somebody who can rush the quarterback. Great stuff, Warren Sharp. Always appreciate you, my man. I mean, one of the best in the business. And again, uh, you tell everybody a little bit about your record over the last several years because uh, it has been outstanding. And I don't think you've had a losing season in a long time. No, not since I've been sharing, you know, this this information publicly. Since I've been doing this, uh, I've never had a losing season. Uh, my computer totals are 61 percent now, um, lifetime, which is obviously very difficult to do. This is NFL. College is a little bit lower than that, but um, college is still uh, around 55 percent lifetime. But uh, NFL is is my baby, and that's 61 percent lifetime. Um, so. Yeah, I, I just I love doing it. It's a passion of mine. I'm now 365 uh, days a year analyzing NFL primarily and um, and having a lot of success doing it. Do we get to see you out here in Vegas in August? That's a good question. I know I've got a, a nice uh, trip planned to the beach in late August, but at some point this summer, once I get this magazine done, I'm going to have to get out there and, and and you know conduct some meetings with some people. So hopefully. Maybe it's not for the for the Super Contest Week, and we'll have to see what the schedule is. But uh, at some point in August, I'd like to come out there, and and definitely I'll keep in touch, and we can we can link up then. Oh no, for sure, gotta. And you know you have a place to stay, and uh, you also uh, have a radio show uh, that people will be wanting to hear from you, Warren Sharp. Always appreciate you, my man. I always appreciate you staying up late back there in D.C. And uh, the wife and kids, everything going okay? Everything is great. And actually, for me, Ken, right now, uh, I'm up till 2 a.m. working every night on this magazine. Right, so it's so lunchtime. All right. It's good. actually early. Yeah, this is actually early for me. I don't mind it one bit. Good we, stuff. we caught him during his break. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Warren, thank you, though. I appreciate you taking time out for us. And uh, I, I tell you what, you've got a, a great following out here in Vegas, and people really respect you. And uh, you're a class act, too. You're, you're just a great guy you know, off the field, so to speak. I've known you for a while and just appreciate you, but, uh, you, you know, you, you're real, and uh, that's what it's all about. God bless you, brother. We'll talk to you soon. All right, sounds great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Warren. Warren Sharp, sharpfootballanalysis.com, at Sharp Football. You can follow Warren on Twitter that way. Come back with my good pal Brady Cannon, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more NFL Draft. We'll get you caught up on the complete Richard Badge and Finley Toyota out-of-town scoreboard live from Steiner's Pub. You know, it's National Pretzel Day. I'm going to have